And Lord, we just bless every single person here, people watching by Bethel TV. We bless every one of them. Lord, we pray that you would expand our borders, that you would deepen our relationship with you, that you would open our eyes uh, of awareness, and that you would, you would touch people through us, that you would touch people, that you would touch us, Lord, that you would, that you would, that you would actually deepen our awareness of you. Lord, we know you're always with us, but we want to be deeply aware that you're with us all the time. And Lord, we want to, we want to see our city have an encounter with you. We want to see this seat be a city on a hill. Amen. Um, I started a series uh, a while ago on apostles and prophets, and I actually preached this message has uh, eight points, and I preached two. So I thought I'd finish them all. So just put three hours on that clock. <laughs> uh, and uh, I want to talk about developing a prophetic movement that reforms the world. And uh, I'm just going to, I'll just quickly go over the first couple of points, uh, or three points that, um, that I shared in the beginning, just so you can kind of be caught up with what um, I'm sharing we have a call to disciple nations. I don't think I have to say too much about that, except for it was a call that began in the heart of Abraham, and it was, that it was a prophecy that actually inspired him. When God, you remember the, the prophecy, come out, look at the stars, go out and look at the sand of the sea, and the prophecy was that you will be a father to many nations. And, um, you know, we kind of sometimes, I think, reduce that to, Abraham was a father to Israel, but actually the call in his life was to be a father to many nations. And that theme gets picked up in Romans 4. It says, in, speaking of Abraham and Sarah not having a child, in hope and against hope they believed, and therefore he was called a father of nations. And the next verse says, and so, he'll, so shall his descendants be. And so um, Jesus, in Matthew 28, of course, his most popular verse on discipling nations where he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven on, and on earth. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations. And I just want to point out that that wasn't a new idea or a new concept. That was actually the promise to Abraham. That Jesus was repeating the promise of Abraham and he took the promise that was on Abraham and he put it into every believer. And so, um, and then we're, so I, I, I wanna, I'm going to share, I don't know if I'll finish this message, probably won't, but I want to share eight attributes of effective prophetic movements that radically reform the world. And number one, they're engaged in culture. And I shared um, in the first message that I preached that I was brought up in the Jesus movement, and our motto was, come out and be separate. And 50 years of coming out and be separate has created a pretty much virtuous society. And I, and I believe that the key verse, or one of the key verses for the season that we're in is in Matthew 13, 33, where Jesus told a parable about the kingdom of heaven. And he said, it's like a woman who took three pecks of flour and made the whole dough leaven, caused everything to rise. And um, Jesus made a point that we're the light, that we are, uh, that we are the light of the world, and that a city set on a hill can't be hidden. I just want to clarify that Jesus said the light is in the world. So when we say the world's getting darker and darker till Jesus comes, how many know we're saying what Jesus didn't say? Jesus actually said that we're placed as a light in the world. If the world's getting darker, it's not the world's fault. Sometimes I think we've misplaced the light. The church keeps getting brighter and the world keeps getting darker. And then we curse the world or develop eschatologies to make it okay for the world to get darker. But we've talked about that a lot already. So number two, number, so what are the attributes of an effective prophetic movement that radically reforms the world? Number one, it's engaged in culture. Number two, it's hopeful. And I already repeated this verse, Matthew 5, 14, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. And, um, and then he goes on, in fact, let me just read you this. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but sets it on a lampstand. And it gives light to the whole house. How many of you ran out of electricity this last year for a season? Yeah, we were out of electricity for like almost, two, almost three weeks, just under three weeks. 
And uh, that verse meant more and more because we were lighting our house with lamps. And I'm like, y- you know, you know something, but then you experience something. And it's like, we were, I, I figured out that if you can take the lamp, we had all different kinds of lamps, oil lamps and candles. And, uh, and the, the higher you put it in the room, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's probably what that meant. <laughs> no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but sets it on a lampstand and then the next verse is, uh, you're, a, you're, a, you're the light of the world, a city set on a hill. Still the metaphor is about light, and the higher you put the light, the more people can see. The next, very next verse says this, which I think is interesting. Um, you let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. I, I love this verse because... You know, I don't know about you, but when I, when I think of light, you know, you're the light of the world. It's like, okay, I'm pretty practical. In fact, I think I'm one of the practical guys here. Like, I listen to Bill, and then I'm like, okay, what's it look like? That's when I, I sit, when Bill speaks a lot, I, I sit and think, okay, how do we practically make that happen? So I, I love this part because Jesus just took, you're the light of the world. I don't know if anyone's saved any money on their electric bill since they've been saved. I have not. So would we agree that the light is a metaphor, right? Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, so how do you be light? How do you be the light of the world? The next verse actually tells us, do your good works, let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works. Did you just, see, did you just realize that Jesus just said light is what? Good works. Let your light shine before men so that they see your Good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. I, I, I thought this was very interesting, and I will just do it really quickly. But in Matthew 5, 16, it says, so they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And Matthew 6 says, don't do your works in a way to be noticed by men. <laughs> Otherwise, you have your reward. And I'm like, do you do good works and do them in a way so people can see them? Or do you hide them so no one knows but you and Jesus? And I think uh, the answer to that is motives are important. We shall go on. So it's hopeful. It's hopeful. Uh, a prophetic people need to be hopeful. I, I remember um, when, I, uh, when I got saved and, and came into the whole prophetic movement, anybody who was grouchy were like, those people are prophets. If you look like you're constipated all the time, you're like, that's probably a prophetic gift on you. <laughs> As if somehow when you were prophetic, you, you were depressed. And uh, I love, you know, Benny's book, The Happy Intercessor. And, you know, we began to realize that the kingdom of God is not eat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Help me understand that being grouchy is not being prophetic. It's a good word right there. Number three, and this is, uh, we haven't spent too much time on this. Uh, so, so number one is it's engaged in culture. Number two, it's hopeful. And number three, it's insightful. It's insightful. And I want to take a little bit of time with this uh, part. It's insightful. In Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 12, 32, if you're taking notes, you might want to note this verse. This is probably one of the most repeated verses in conferences right now. For those of us that travel and hear other people speak, this, this, this actual verse uh, 1 Chronicles 12, 32. I bet you'll probably know it as soon as I read the first part. The sons of Issachar were men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do in the times. Uh, and this is part, in my mind, this is part of what the prophets, this is part of what the prophets are responsible for in the Lord, in my mind. We gather the prophets at my house, 30 of us or uh, 40 of us, uh, not, not too often, but four or five times a year, and, uh, and I just like to hear, like, what are you hearing? What are you seeing? Like, what's happening to you? And I, I feel like this is the role, we, one of the roles we play as prophets and prophetesses and prophetic people is that we have insight for the times. And we know what, what we should, like, we, we get insights and we also get insights into what to do about the insights we have. I don't know if that came out right, but they understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. Look at this. Jesus, in Matthew 16, verse 1, he actually picks up this theme, and he says to the Pharisees, the Pharisees and Sadducees came up to him, testing him, and they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Listen to Jesus' response. But he replied to them, 
When it's evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky? But you cannot discern the signs of the times. It's, it's interesting to me that at least the religious leaders were actually looking for a sign. What I'm getting at is our culture often isn't even looking for a sign. I want to give the Pharisees a little credit here. Yes, they were trying to test, test him. Yes, they had bad motives. But my point is, is that their culture understood that there were signs to read the times. And they were asking Jesus for a sign. In other words, like the sons of Issachar understood the signs. They understood the seasons and times. They were saying, show us a sign of the times. And Jesus said, he's basically saying, listen, I'm Christ. I'm standing right in front of you. You've waited 4,000 years for the Christ. There's 100 prophecies about the Christ. And you're looking for a sign, and I'm standing in front of you, and you know how to tell the weather, but you don't even know how to tell the signs of the time is standing in front of you. And I think that sometimes uh, we get so close, I know this is a, an uh, idiom that we share all the time, but we get so close to the forest that we can't recognize the trees. But here's the point that I'd like to make. The religious leaders could predict the weather, but they couldn't figure out the epoch seasons or the epic seasons they were living in, that the signs of those epoch seasons were all around them. There's a, a couple of Greek words for the word time. In, um, we have one word for the word time, as you know. The Greeks had two words. The Hebrews only had one word. And why is that important? Because the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, and the New Testament's written in Greek. So the Greeks had this really, uh, uh, the Greeks had this specific word, two words for the word time, one being chronos. We get our word chronology. It's like a clock and a calendar. And the other word, kairos, um, here's uh, an example of Kairos when we said, hey, we went to the conference and we had a great time. How many know we're not talking about Kronos? We're not saying, wow, the, the, it wasn't the calendar beautiful? We're saying we had a great time. If, if we could say that in Greek, we would say we had a great Kairos. Describing the moment, not describing the calendar or the clock. Are you with me? And so what we learn is that there are kairos times. No, let's try let's, let's back up and see if I can say this right. There are chronos times that get interrupted by kairos moments. Now, let me just back up and say this uh, because people are writing me and asking me questions like, kairos doesn't mean holy or divine. It's just a way to describe time. It's a secular word. Are you with me? So when we say there's Kairos times, we, we aren't necessarily saying God's created him. But now I'm saying to you that there are Kronos times that get inter interrupted by divine Kairos times. And these Kairos times have to be discerned so that we know what to do in the times. And I'm saying that there's an anointing on you, if you will pick it up right now, even as I'm talking, there's an anointing on you to understand the times. Now, in the Old Testament, the, the word times, remember, there's only one word for it. So you're, somebody wrote me and said, the word, uh, the word for times and the sons of Iskar understood the times, that word isn't kairos or chronos. I'm like, yes, because Hebrew only has one word for time, just like us. So it's the description that determines whether it's kairos or chronos. Making sense so far? Okay. So again, let me repeat. Kairos and Kronos are not holy words. When we say there's a Kairos moment, we're not necessarily saying that God's involved, but I'm saying to you that God often interrupts Kronos times with divine Kairos times. Are, are you following me? And, um, and, and, and I want to say that I believe that we're in a Kairos, divine Kairos moment. Now, um, I love this quote. I'll share this quote with you. I've shared it many times. Eric Hoffer said, in times of change, learners inherit the earth. 
Well, the learned find themselves beautifully prepared for a world that no longer exists. Why is it important for us to understand divine kairos times? Because we may be building something that actually is irrelevant for the season we're in. And I also want to point out that if you, okay, let's see. If you sit in the first heaven, are you with me? Which is the visible kingdom. Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth. Visible kingdom. In other words, this is the, this is the heaven right here according to Genesis. Are you with me? And the second heaven is in Ephesians chapter 6. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in heavenly places. How many know there's no demons or principalities in God's heaven? Okay, so we call that the second heaven. Are you with me? Okay, I'm just trying to make sure everybody understands the terms. And then Paul said, I knew a man who went to the third heaven, and he saw things that were indescribable, and we know that he's talking about himself. I went to the third heaven. Why is this important? Because when Jesus died on the cross, he disarmed and defeated the enemy. So the devil has power because Jesus said, I give you power, which is the word deutimus, over all the power of the enemy. So how many understand he has power, deutimus, and you have more power? Okay, but here's the important part. He has no authority. He had authority because Adam gave it to him. Right? God gave Adam authority over the earth. Adam and Eve, humans, people. God gave Adam and Eve authority over the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, and subdue the earth. Right? When Adam and Eve, God said, this is, I'm trying to just make this as simple and quick as possible so I can get some more points. But this is the foundation of your Christianity. When Adam and Eve ate the tree of knowledge, the tree God said don't eat, how many understand they didn't just disobey God? They obeyed the devil. Because God said don't eat, and the devil said eat. What I'm getting at is they changed masters. So in Luke 4, where the temptation in the wilderness where Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil, right? You with me? The devil said, if you fall down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world for they've been handed over to me. Who handed them over to him? Adam. Are you with me? So why did Jesus have to become a man? Well, for many reasons, but here's one. Because God gave the earth, gave man control over the earth. The heavens, the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth has been given to the sons of men. So how many know God had to become a man? So the Son of God became the Son of Man, so the sons of men could become sons of God. Are you with me? Okay, this is all like foundational for what I'm going to say next is the only reason I take you through the theology. So when Jesus rose from the dead and he said, all authority has been given to me, I want you to understand what he was saying. He was saying the devil had authority, Adam gave it to him. Okay, remember the devil still has power, but he has no authority. Who has authority? You do because Jesus died as a man. We understand he was fully God, but he was fully man. He died as a man so that he could get authority back legally from the devil. And he gave it to you. To humans. Are you with me? Okay. So what I'm getting at is this, is that so we live in the first heaven, humans, but as born-again people, we live in the first heaven and the third heaven. Yep. Now, why is that important? Because if we only live in the first heaven, even though the second heaven has been dis- disarmed and defeated from the standpoint of authority, how many understand, if you don't take your rightful place, the second heaven is over the first heaven. But if you take your rightful place and you're seated in, in the first heaven, you're here on earth, Render to Caesar what Caesar's. That whole idea of we do live in this heaven, we do deal with Caesar. It's, it's a metaphor. But we also live in the third heaven. More than this, the third heaven, so let me just make this clear. 
you don't just live in the third heaven because so do the angels. The demons live in the second heaven. The angels live in the third heaven. But you've been seated in the third heaven far above all principalities and powers and every name that's ever been named. In other words, you sit above the angels, so you were created a little lower than the angels, but when you were born again, you were born again above the angels. And now the angels, Hebrews chapter 1 says that they are servants of those who receive salvation. So the angels are at your service. And you're seated in heavenly places where? With Christ. In other words, why is that important? It's like, are we all sitting on one small seat? Like, scoot over. I don't have enough room. No, no, no. It, he's saying that the authority that is in Christ is in you. Are, are you following me? Okay, why is that important when we're talking about seasons and times? Because if, you, if, if believers don't take the rightful place in the third heaven then the epic seasons, epoch seasons, E-P-O-C-H, means a way in which God deals with a certain people in a certain time. Too many definitions, or am I losing you? Totally. I'm saying God wants to control the kairos moments. But if we don't take our rightful place, then the second heaven is determining the kairos moments. Let me give you a verse. It's not in my notes, but it just came to me. Listen to this, Daniel chapter 7. It says... Um, Daniel chapter 7, that's it. Daniel chapter 7 says, uh, I'm, I'm jumping into the middle of a whole long idea that we're not going to read. But I just want to read you this part. He's talking about the devil in the end times. And he said, he will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one. And he'll tend to make alterations into the times and the law. And they will give, be given to him into his hand for a time, times, and a half time. Now, do you understand that the word time there is only one word in the Hebrew? But he's not talking about the clock. He's talking about that God set up kairos, divine kairos moment. Not chronos, kairos. Times, times, and a half time. And even though God determined the kairos moment, are you with me? The devil took it over. Twice. Times, times, and a half time. Listen to what it says. It says, and he will intend to make alterations in the times. In other words, God had decreed something for a Kairos moment, but the enemy is twisting it. He's turning it. He's, making, he's taking a God thing, and he's using it against us. Are you with me? And he'll tend to make, he'll try to make, it'll be given to him for times, times, and half time. But listen to the next verse. But the court will sit for judgment, and dominion will be taken away from him, annihilated, and destroyed forever. In the midst of this Kairos moment, where God goes, he decrees something, and the devil goes, I'll twist that. He decrees something else, God. The devil twists it. He decrees another thing, and the devil begins to twist it, and God goes, that's enough. And he steps into the middle of the Kairos moment, and he goes, I'll take this over. Here's my point. How does the devil get charge of Kairos times? Because God decrees them, and we end up staying in the first heaven. And when you stay in the first heaven, instead of rise and shine, you rise and reflect culture. See, there's only two ways to stay relevant to people who don't yet know the Lord. One is to lead them, rise and shine. The other, if you can't lead them, then you end up reflecting them, or you're irrelevant to culture. What the church has been famous for is rise and reflect. We try to be like the world so that we can stay connected to them and at least be relevant to them. And I'd like to propose that God has not called us to be the tail but the head. Now, now sometimes that for some people that means we're in charge, but not in the way you think. We're in charge in that we become light and people want to come to the light, and we begin to dictate the Kairos moments. No, let's say it differently. God dictates the Kairos moments, and we take leadership because we're leading from the third heaven, not from the first heaven, and we're dictating the times and seasons. Are you with me? But if we don't take those Kairos times and seasons, then the second heaven is leading the first heaven because we left our throne. 
Okay. I understand that may sound irrelevant to some folks. Okay. I woke up, uh, uh, this is uh, three months ago. I should, uh, I should record dates on these. It would help. I woke up for five mornings in a row with the word providence in my mind. Providence. And I, I don't use the word providence, so I'm like, how you know it's the Lord? It's like, I don't use that word. Maybe the devil does, but I don't use that word. And I, I just kept hearing the word providence. So I, I got up and uh, the fifth day, and I'm like, maybe it's the Lord. And I looked up the word providence, and it means the foreseeing care and guidance of God over cr- the creatures of the earth. It also means God, especially when conceived as all-knowing, is directing the universe and the affairs of mankind with wise benevolence. Um, basically, uh, providence in this setting means God takes charge. And I, uh, and, I, and I began to connect with God about this word providence on the fifth day. And I'm like, what is going on? Why do you keep giving me this word providence? And the Lord said, we're moving from free will to providence. I'm like, all right. I have no idea what that means. I mean, I believe in free will. I also believe in sovereignty. I don't always know how it works. And I know there's people that they build a whole theological case for sovereignty. And I know there's a whole bunch of people over here that build a whole theological case for free will. And I'm like, I, I, I'm like, I, I'm like well, I don't know how, all, how it all works. But, and so then I, I went to sleep and I woke up. This is the fifth day. I was asking the Lord, like, what does this mean? And how does it work? And why do you keep using the word providence with me? And is there something we're supposed to do? Is there something we're supposed to prepare for? Like, what, what will we do? And how, what does it mean? And, I, and uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, and the Lord said to me, the iniquity of the Amorite is now complete. Okay, so I look up the iniquity of the Amorite, because I know my Bible so well. And I do remember the story. And, and let, me, let me just uh, share it with you. Uh, it's in Genesis chapter 15, and God is having a conversation with his friend Abraham. And we're just going to pick up in the middle of the story. Verse 12. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, the terror and great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and, will, and they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. Pick up this, this uh, verse, 400 years. Remember that. For 400 years. But I also judge the nation whom they serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall, not, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Okay, follow me for a minute. It's going to all make sense in just a minute. So for 400 years, you know that after Joseph, that there was a pharaoh. This is uh, Exodus chapter 1. I'm, yes, Exodus chapter 1. There was a pharaoh, it says, who knew not Joseph. And he enslaved the people of God for 400 years. Are you with me? In Egypt. You'll remember that Moses went in in year 360, in the 360th year, and he tried to free the people. Do you remember the story? Maybe you've read it in the Bible or you've seen the movie. Do you remember that, that, his, uh, that an Egyptian soldier was mistreating an Israelite and he rose up and killed him? And he thought that his brothers would know what he was doing. Remember this? And then two brothers were fighting and Moses stepped in and said, hey, what are you doing? And they said, who made you a leader or ruler of your people? Do you remember this whole thing? Okay, and he tried to, he tried to free the Israelites from Egypt, but it was the 360th year. And what did God tell Abraham? It would be 400 years. And he said, in the 400th year, he said, the iniquity of the Amorite would be complete. Are you with me? Uh, And then God would deliver them. Okay, so follow me. What happened for the 400 years? If you were in if you were an Israelite in Egypt, you're praying, and you might say the heavens are brass. You're saying, God, get us out of here. God, free us. But nothing's happening. You know why? Because God has given for 400 years the world, or the Egyptians and Israelites at least, over to 
over to free will. Are you with me? The Egyptians are using their free will to oppress the Israelites. Am I making sense at all? Okay. And then in the 400th, in the 400th year, so, Ab- so, so Moses tries to free the people, and he, he fails terribly, and he's out in the wilderness. For how long? 40 years. Why? Because the prophecy to Abraham was in the 400th year, and God numbered the year for a reason. He was waiting for the iniquity of the Amorite to be complete. In other words, he gives freedom for a certain time until sin gets so bad, God goes, that's enough. And then God intervenes with sovereignty. Are you with me? Do you understand that if you're, now it's, an, it, now it's a metaphor. If you're in year 360, you're to behave very different than if, in year, if you're in the year 401, 401. In other words, what worked in slavery is, is not going to work when God says it's time to leave. And God decrees a move against free will. It even says that eventually he hardens the heart of Pharaoh. In other words, God goes, I gave you an opportunity to act in free will in providence, but you chose not to. So now you will act outside of free will in providence, and you will do what I tell you to do. And he becomes a puppet of God's providence. Do you, are you with me? No, you're like, why are you telling us all this? Because I woke up with God saying the iniquity of the Amorite is complete. It's going to get a little dark before it gets bright. So I prayed and I said to God, God, what does that? Okay, I understand. I understand the principle. I, I, I read the story. I understand the principle. And I understand that you're sovereignly, in, you're saying there's a sovereign move of God don't, don't, that you can't stop. And I said, what is the, the iniquity of the Amorite? What does that mean? It's a metaphor, but what does it mean for us? And suddenly I saw the mutilation of children being transgendered. And the Lord said, that is the last straw. Yeah. That's what he said to me. And I felt the Lord say to me, I endured abortion. I endured the oppression of ethnic groups. But I am done the, the, the sins of the world have caused the season to change. And in the story of Moses and Egypt, you know that that was inspired through a burning bush. Egypt and I'm sorry, Moses encounters a burning bush. God speaks to him, says, I've seen the oppression of my people, da da da, I send you. And I I feel like there's a powerful, sovereign move of God. When I say revival, sometimes when I say revival in our language, that means the churches are going to be full, people are going to worship for seven days a week. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about there's going to be a virtuous, a virtue, moral, powerful revival that's going to touch the nations. I, uh, I asked the Lord if that ever had happened in the New Testament. Like, give me some verses. And I was remembering in Acts chapter 4, for the congregation, it says in verse 32, the congregation of those who believe are one heart and one mind. They, claimed, they, never, they didn't claim that anything belonging to them was his own, but they began common property. And what, what they did is they began to sell their, their extra land or their extra property, their houses, whatever they had that they, they didn't need, and they began to give it to the people in need. And actually, they didn't actually give it to the people. As you know, they took the money and they laid it at the apostles' feet, and the apostles distribute the money, which means not only were they generous, but they were also honoring of authority. 
and they built trust with their authority. And they said, even though I see my neighbor has a need, I'll give it to the apostle. I'll let the apostles determine who gets what, and they'll distribute the money. Very powerful, right? And then it says, and, and here's the outcome of it. It says, and, great, and, the, and, and with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was on them all. And then it goes on to say, but a man named Ananias, this is the very next verse, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property and kept some of the price back for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it to the apostles, they laid it at the apostles' feet. And it goes on to say that Ananias and Sapphira laid this money at the apostles' feet, and they pretended that they sold the property for, let's pretend, uh, it's just a metaphor. They sold the property for $30,000, and they said, here's the 30000 But the truth is, they sold the property for 60000 and they gave thirty. dollars but they tried to pretend like they had done what everyone else had done, which was give it all. Are you with me? And as you know, it ends up in the death of Ananias and Sapphira. And by the way, I don't think they died and went to hell. I just think they died before their time. And as we know, the most famous liar is in the entire New Testament is the one interviewing them, Peter. I don't know if you've ever read that story and think, how come Peter didn't die for denying Christ, but they died for lying about how much they sold the property for? And by the way, how many of you have never lied? Please raise your hand. <laughs> uh, my point is, is that if that was the standard of the gospel, I don't think anyone would be in this room. We'd all be dead. My, and here's my real point, and the point that I feel like the Lord gave me. It's not that they lied, but when they lied that killed them. See, no one, ever, no, one ever lied, no one ever died from lying again, as far as we know, at least not in the entire New Testament. And I'd, I'd, I'd propose that many people lied after Ananias and Sapphira, but no one ever died for it again, at least that it's recorded. My point is, is that they died not because they lied, but because of when they lied. They lied in a Kairos time when God was building the foundation of the church and he wanted it to be pure. And how many know it wasn't that they lied because we'd all be dead, but it's when they lied. And what I'm getting at is they didn't understand the Kairos moment and that a little white lie was not going to work right now because God was doing something and they got in the way of it. Many years ago, I was uh, going through a season like I probably anyone who's, been, who's walked with the Lord for a time probably has been through this especially in this prophetic movement. And I had all these prophecies that were north, but my life was going south. Did anyone else ever experience that? And it's like, I don't want one more prophecy because they're making me feel hopeless. <laughs> and so uh, I just went through this season where I'm like, okay, I think I'm just going to go south. I think I'm just going to stop believing for north and go south. And I'm just going to like, you know, I just don't think those prophecies are real and, you know, and, and how many of you know, Joseph had the same issue. God says to the Old Testament Joseph, you're going to be a great leader, and the very next event in his life is he's a slave. <laughs> and then he's like, I'm, he gets out of slavery, and he moves into a prisoner. And I'm like, uh, you prophesied I was going to be a leader, and now I'm like the least of everything. Not only am I not a leader, I'm actually a prisoner. And I, my life was going like that. And I, I just started to like, like I just, I would tell God, like, no more prophecies. I need a fulfillment. Like one would be, even one would be good right now. And so I got so discouraged that I'm like, okay, I'm just going to believe for the direction I'm going. And I had, and, and then I went on like that for a couple, I don't know how long it was, maybe a week or a few weeks. And one night, I had this vision. And in the vision, I saw God walking down this path. And there was people standing in front of him, almost like a lineman in a football game. And they were standing in, intentionally like, like they were resisting him. And he was just grabbing them and throwing them, like rag dolls. He was just throwing them. And the next, in the next scene, I'm next. And our eyes meet, 
And he says to me, get out of my way. And in the dream, you know how these dreams are. In the dream, I'm, I'm thinking, should I or should I resist? <laughs> I understand how stupid that is when you're awake. But when you're dreaming, it's quite different. Should I? So I put my hands like this, my arms like to do what everyone else is doing. Like, and he says to me, get, he's looking right at my eyes, get out of my way. And when he gets right next to me, he reaches out to grab my arm. I move quickly like, <laughs> and he passes me. He never looks back, and he goes, now just follow. Now just follow. He said to me, just follow. And when I woke up, I have to tell you that it just made everything simple for me. I, 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 you know, I, I'm, I don't know, you know, I'm obviously not educated, but I'm a thinker. And sometimes you just have to stop thinking. <laughs> Listen, I, I, we're teaching students, like, think, think. If you're a student, how many times have I said in the room, please think. But there are times when thinking just don't work. Like you just have to turn off your thunker and just follow. Are you with me? Sometimes, listen, I'm not saying be stupid. I, I, you know, we have the mind of Christ. I just wrote a book on spiritual intelligence. But there are times when God just goes, follow. And I go, this doesn't make sense. And he's like, that's why it's called the faith, not the fact. And there are times when everyone else will think you're crazy. Right? And you think you're crazy. Like, you're coming to Bethel. Why? why? Why are you going there? That's a cult. You know that's a cult? And you're going to school for how long? And you're going to get how many degrees are you going to get? No degrees. And how is that going to help you? And you're like, I don't know. I just know I'm supposed to go. And trying to explain something that's here, is here. They didn't come this way. It came this way. And you're trying to explain it to people who don't have this. And I don't know about you, but sometimes you just give up. You're just like, whatever. I just know. <laughs> got to follow. <laughs> I got to follow. And I don't know about you, but I often find myself like Abram and Sarai. Not Abraham yet. And God calls them out of the Chaldeans yeah. to a place I will show you. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but I bet you have. Like, when someone asks you, after you just leave the Chaldeans, your home, you get it? It's a metaphor. Where are you going? You don't know where you're going, because God didn't tell you. You just know where you can't stay. I, I have to be honest. I'm a prophet. I hate those seasons. I want to know where we're going. Like, it's my responsibility to tell you all where we're going, right? It's my main job. Here's where we're going. How I many you know when the Lord blinds the prophet, you in big trouble? You know that verse that says God's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path? I figured out that's two different seasons. God's a lamp to our feet. That's a season where we just put one foot in front of the other. Where are you going? I have no idea. Because the emphasis isn't on where I'm going. The emphasis is on who I'm with. And I've realized that until I'm very... Till I trust the one I'm with, I actually don't get to know where I'm going. God's more concerned about knowing him than he is about knowing your destiny. And I think that often God hides our destiny so, we'll, so we have no choice but to trust him. Like he just breaks your GPS. Your God position sensor. You just breaks. You have no idea. Where are we going? No, no, follow me. Feels like we're going in circles. Not letting you in till you're ready. It, my, it's my personal conviction that Joseph of the Old Testament, you know how he got this prophetic word that he was going to rule his brothers? 
and his parents. Remember this word? It's my conviction that Joseph didn't have to go to prison or be a slave. But his arrogance determined his journey. Like, I think that God gives you a prophetic declaration. You know, here's the promise. Metaphorically, here's the palace. And how are you going to get there is way determined by what kind of attitude you need to live in the palace. If you get to the palace without the process, you can't stay there. And I think if Joseph, this is obviously, this is subjective. It's not in the Bible. It's just my opinion. I think if Joseph would have humbly served his brothers and father after he got that vision, if he would have humbled himself, God, I mean, you know, if you humble yourself from the mighty hand of God, he will exalt you at the proper time. If Joseph would have humbled himself, I wonder if he would have been in prison. Because how many you know, there are many paths. There's not many paths to God, let me be clear, but there are many paths to your promise. There are ways to behave in free will, and there are ways to behave in providence. And I will say the next great lesson that we're going to learn is the fear of God. We have lost the fear of God. I uh, was remembering in Joshua chapter 5. This is the, when they're supposed to take Jericho. And they're, you, know, you could imagine Joshua was terrified. Uh, Jericho is a double-walled city. And it's the very first city that they were, ever, the first city they ever had to take was a double walled city, meaning um, the Jericho walls, that's why they're called walls and not a wall, is there was an outside wall, and then there was space, and there was an inside wall. Uh, if you got over the first wall, you got stuck in between two walls. So, um, Jer- so um, Joshua went out to survey the wall, figured out it was walls. And he sees this angel who's in the middle early in the morning who has a sword and Joshua you can imagine he's completely terrified and he says to the angel are you for us or are you against us and the angel says no (laughs) are you for us or are you for them no rather I've come as the captain of the Lord of hosts uh, what he just said to Joshua was, I'm not on your team, you are on mine. <laughs> the point I'm making is he just took over leadership from Joshua and said, I'll be leading now. Yeah. How many know that's sovereignty? Yeah. He went from Joshua, you got free will, let me tell you how you're going to win. And then Joshua's like, are you on our team? He's like, no, nope. you're on my team. And the question is, are you going to follow me? I feel like we're in this huge transition, and it's really important that we, as the people of God, understand the transition so that we're singing the right song in the right season. Jesus said to the, to the Jews, John sang the dirge, and you didn't mourn. Uh, the dirge is the funeral song. I'm talking about John the Baptist. And he said, I played the flute, which is the wedding song, and you didn't dance. Uh, the point he's making to them is, you weren't congruent with any Cairo season. When it was time to mourn, you didn't mourn. You missed it completely. And then when it was time to dance, you were mourning. <laughs> you were incongruent with every season. And I'm saying, what makes a prophetic generation powerful for the transforming of culture is you know what song's playing you understand the music we're even singing it like there are prophetic songs that are being written now i now jesus was talking using songs as a metaphor because i don't think john ever sang a song i don't think jesus ever sang a song so he was using music as a metaphor but how many you know that music is also 
what God uses to determine the season. Uh, how many of you love movies? I love movies. Have you ever turned off the sound on an action movie when they're not talking, but it's still a completely different movie? Because in a movie, <laughs> this is too much for you. In a movie, you, you, it, it kind of goes like this. The, you know, in the background, you have this background music going, da dun da dun da dun da 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 And all of a sudden, it goes, da 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 Always right before a shift in the scene. And it tells you, better watch closely. Something's about to happen. Right? The music changes because the scene's about to change. Isaiah 42, 9. The former things have come to pass. Behold, I proclaim new things to you. Sing to the Lord a new song. How many know the music always changes right before providence happens? The question is, do you know what song is being played? Pay attention to the songs that the prophets are singing whether they're doing da 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 and people are going, it's going to be bad. And you're like, no, that's not the song. But then you come to church and they're going da 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 da. And you're like, I don't know what's going on, but I can feel something just changed. Why? The song changed. I have five minutes. Plus. I believe that God's called us to four roles in culture. You should write these down. I did get these prophetically. The first one is that we are futurists. We're prophetic visionaries who with divine foresight and insight. No, let me write, read it again. We're prophetic visionaries who with divine foresight and inspired insights peer into the future as it was meant to be to direct society towards their noble purpose and timeless promise. In other words, a futurist looks into the future and goes, this is where we're going. Course correction. Okay, let's, let's, let's correct because this is where we're going. And we see the future and we begin to measure the present with the future and draw a line. You know, you hear a lot, and especially in the book of Revelation, it says an angel came out and he drew a plumb line. What's he talking about? He's talking about from the present to the future. We're making adjustments. We're futurists. We see the future before it happens. In fact, often we're causing the future. Obviously with God. How many of you know prophecy is foretelling? I'm telling you the future. But it's also foretelling. I'm causing the future. Do oh, you have a scripture for that? I do. Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel goes to the boneyard. And God says, can these bones live? How many know he wasn't prophesying about the bones? He was prophesying to the bones. Sometimes the Lord takes prophetic people like you and me, and he, takes, and he, takes, he tells us to call things that are not as though they are. So sometimes we're not just identifying the way, we're preparing the way. Number two, we are solutionaries. We are prophetic solutionaries, people who bring wisdom, knowledge, and experience, and skill to bear on pressing and entrenched challenges in an effort to create positive change in communities. I believe that this is the main role we're playing right now in our own city, that we are being called upon as wise counselors to find solutions for homelessness, Today for the coronavirus, for crime, for the economy of our city, for the negative social statistics that our city is experiencing, and in our, in our nation, for, for uh, racism, for 
you know, I see this picture I'm trying to reconcile, but I believe the Lord's going to call us to reconcile police officers and African Americans, and we have all these different things that are rising up in our country, and we can just take sides, or we can actually come in and be solutionaries. Like, great, we can all get mad at each other, but what, that's, is that solving the issue? And I propose it's not. And is there real issues? Are there people, for example, uh, there, there, there are uh, 68 million, I think, people that don't have health insurance. Is that an issue? You bet it is. There are immigrants that are trying to get into our country, and many of them are fleeing a terrible situation. Is that, is that our problem? Absolutely it is. And, 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 I, and by the way, I'm not saying, open the doors, let everyone in. I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, we, if that was that simple, we'd have it solved. But I'm saying, instead of running away from it or throwing rocks at people who are trying to solve it or making accusations about different people's, you know, motives. Well, your motive is you just try to, you're just trying to put children in cages. You're just trying to keep people, you're just trying to build the walls. It's like, uh, can, 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 can we step in as 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19 with a spirit of reconciliation? Can we come in and be solutionaries can we not be polarized politically? Can we be loyal to the king and his kingdom? Are you for us or against us? No. I feel like that's the word of the Lord. Are you for us? Or are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? No. I've come as a kingdom solutionary. Which means that we have to figure out how to do that. And we have to be wise about our words, our, the things we post, because we polarize people before we ever get invited to anything. And by the way, by the way, I do it too. Like, I, I realize later, like, oh, we should have been wiser about the way I said that. And, and um, you know, if you're a 65-year-old white man, sometimes you don't understand what offends other people, because you didn't walk in their shoes. And, and you said something that was very very harsh to them, you didn't even realize it. You're like, oh, I, would have, I wasn't trying to offend anybody. So I'm saying we have to learn, we have to grow, we have to get engaged, we have to be part of the solution. And in order to be part of the solution, you have to listen. You have to listen, but you have to listen, right? We have to, we have to figure out how to get involved. We have to understand history. I wanna say just a little bit about history. Sometimes our offense causes us to not see history clearly. How important is history? Well, it's important for two reasons. One, the Lord did things in history, and that's the testimony, right? What God did, he'll do it again. But how many of you know that humans did things in history that wasn't good? And if you don't understand history, you may be repeating it. I may be repeating it. I don't even know it. Right? Anybody have teenage kids? Who has teenagers in here? How many of you ever see your, your teenage kids? I have teenage grandkids. I have 10 grandkids now, and I think seven of them are teenagers. And I'm like, I, I not only saw what I did wrong, I saw what my kids did wrong. And I watch my grandkids, and I'm like, yeah, you might want to ask me about that. <laughs> and, you know, you know, you can't, you know, I haven't been around long enough to know, like, hey, come over here. Don't do that. I realize when I say don't do that, sometimes it makes them do the very thing I don't want them to do. So I'm wise enough to not say don't do that, but I'm also over here like, please ask me. Because I already did that. I went down that path. I watched your, I watched your mother go down that path. Watch your grandfather. Like, yeah, yeah. It, you know, you just like, like history is important because there's no, you don't have to learn from your mistakes. You can learn from mine and make some new ones. But when you're offended at history, you're like, George Washington had slaves. Yeah, and, and it's been reported that he even had a child with a slave. And you're like, yes, just people are just, and the, and the country is evil, and we, it wasn't founded on Christian values, and, and you're just offended. And, and we, we look at any time God's doing something, he's doing it with humans. Martin Luther King is, a, he's a hero of mine. I, I love listening to his preaching. I love his speeches. Like, I just, you can just get on YouTube and listen to him. It's like, he's the most inspiring. He was a reverend. 
I love the fact that he's a, he was a Christian reverend who engaged culture for justice and did it in a very godly way. But Martin Luther King also was, had moral issues and, and was a womanizer and an adulterer. And if you look through the lens of history with offense, you're like, well, that couldn't have been God. And I'd propose that everything that humans do gets a little twisted. I mean, okay, it's intense in here. Uh, I mean, um, if you're going to be offended at history, you'll, you'll, you'll cut Proverbs out of the Bible. Uh, you, you'll need to cut all the Psalms out, too, because uh, David was, was uh, an adulterer and a murderer. And so if you want to be offended by history, you're like, how can God use a man like that? My only point is, he did. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I'll tell you what. The first time you hear something, you think, well, I don't, think, I don't agree with that. The second time you hear it, you, you're like, I heard that before. And the third time you hear it, is, you say, isn't that a great idea I had? <laughs> I'm simply pointing out that when you're offended by history, you miss the lessons that are in the midst of, human, of humans. Oh, who likes the book of Esther? Come on, ladies, be honest. Put them hands up. The book of Esther is really an odd book. Esther was not in a beauty contest. She was in a sex contest. She was a sex slave and her cousin Mordecai encouraged her to do it. God wasn't saying, like, here's how to make friends and influence people. <laughs> and what makes Esther a beautiful story is she took first place. But the king was married, and the most virtuous person in the entire book of Esther is Vashi, his first wife, who wouldn't dance for his for her husband when he was drunk. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, let's go on. <laughs> I'm simply saying, like, I don't know if there's such thing as a perfect story. I'm not, it's just because God is in, in the middle of it doesn't mean people don't mess it up. And when people mess it up, if you're going to be offended, you're going to miss the points of where God was involved. Are you with me? You're going to, you know, God is going to send Moses in to deliver the people. But how many of you know Moses gets there 40 years early and kills someone? It's like, well, everything he did from there on, he's a murderer. I don't, I, I'm not going to read the book of Exodus or Genesis or the first five books he wrote. I'm saying, if you're going to be offended by Moses' humanness, you're going to miss history. Just because our founding father did stuff wrong, we should acknowledge that he did stuff wrong. But it doesn't mean that God wasn't in the middle of building a beautiful country. Did they get it all right? No. But was God in the middle of it? Yes, he was. Did humans mess it up some? Yes, they did. How did they do that? They're humans. How many love the nation of Israel? You know, the nation of Israel was founded by Jacob who had 13 children, 12 sons and a daughter, from two wives and two concubines. Oh, that's a beautiful story. You want to talk about blended families? <laughs> I'm saying, if you want to get offended by history, you're going to miss the whole point. God takes a guy who gets it completely wrong, and he goes, we'll make a beautiful nation out of that. I propose that's your story. Sometimes when we, like, judge Martin Luther King or George Washington or just name your favorite person in history, and we're like, hey, <laughs> you'll forget about you. Because we want people to judge us by our Christian acts and forget that we had all these other ones. <laughs> and we're like, brother, that's under the blood. Well, how do we know that some of these people in history, there's not under the blood too? I don't know. Let's go on. Oh, I'm way over now. 
Okay, I'll just give you the last two, that we are also cultural architects, leaders who are shaping culture and inspire collective reasoning that helps create healthy, happy, safe, and prosperous communities for the generations to come. There's a war over who gets to shape culture. I, I said to 13 Congress women and men, this is last year, in a, I met them and I said, you guys think, uh, they were uh, Republicans in a Democratic-controlled uh, house, uh, Congress. And so they were all like, oh, yeah, our days are over. I'm like, and I said, you know, did God, did God call you? And they began one by one telling their testimony of how they got elected the first time. And every one of them had a divine story. A divine story. One guy's story is really, they were all amazing. One guy said, in fact, the guy who was complaining the most. <laughs> I said, do you have a story? Did God, did God put you here or did you? He goes, no, no, let me tell you a story. I was in business. And he said, and I, I was praying and I suddenly felt like I was supposed to run for Congress. And he said, and the Lord gave me this word. And I said, Lord, if it's you, please confirm it. He said, that very moment, I, was, I got my car and I was driving to work. And I saw this thing on the side of the road. And the Lord said to me, go back and pick that thing up. So he drove around. It was on the freeway. He drove around off the cloverleaf, back on the highway, and stopped. And it was a license plate that had fallen off a car with the exact word the Lord gave him that morning on the license plate. Instead of going to work, he goes home. He tells his wife, I had this encounter this morning, and the Lord gave me this word, and it's on a license plate. And she said, was it this word? And she gives him the same word that was on the license plate. And then, and then that inspired the next person sitting next to him to say, I had have, I have the same thing happen. He said, I ran against the, the incumbent. He raised $4.3 million. I raised 68000 I had half of my money left, and I won by a landslide. And they went around and told their stories. And I said, you guys think you're Congress people, but God says you're cultural architects, and he puts you here, like Daniel, Esther, and Joseph, to shape history. And I'll give you the last one. We're Kairos conductors, and I think I've said enough about that. We know the times and the appropriate action or act and attitude that's required by the times. Would you stand, please? Thank you for listening so long. We'll get to point four sometime during the year. I would just like you to put your hands on your chest and I want you to receive these four new, maybe new for you. I want you to receive these four new identities into your very nature. I want, I want to prophesy that you are futurists. That you see the future and you begin to build plumb lines to the future and often God will cause you to prophesy the future. I want you to say, I received that for myself. I want you to receive it for your children too, would you? You are solutionaries. I want you to say, I received that for myself. You are people who bring wisdom and knowledge and experience to bear on pressing needs and entrenched challenges to move communities to a positive place. Lord, I just prophesy that they are solutionaries. I just release a spirit of wisdom on you right now and that you would actually wake up with solutions for your situations, for your cities. I just pray for that right now. And some of you would take... God would take you like Joseph out of prison. You, he would take you out of your obscurity, and you'd be like, I know what that dream means. I know where we're going. Hey, here's the right solution for this times. Yeah. Number three, that you'd be cultural architects. Cultural architects, that leaders who shape culture, inspire collective reasoning that helps create healthy, happy, safe, and prosperous communities for the generations to come. And I just release that over you right now and over people who are watching too, that you would become cultural architects, that you would shape culture for the health of your city and for your community and for your church and for your organization and for your nation. And the last one, that you would be, cult that you'd be Kairos conductors. You'd be like the sons of Issachar who understood the times 
and knew what Israel should do in the times, that you would not be like the Pharisees and Sadducees who could not read the signs of the times, but you would be people that know the music. You'd be able to listen to the next song. You'd be like, here's the song that's playing. Hey, we're not mourning anymore. We're not singing the dirge. We're playing the flute. Hey, let's shift. Eric Hoffer, in times of change, learners, help me, inherit the earth. Well, the learn find themselves beautifully prepared for a world that no longer exists. Lord, we just become, we just right now, we just receive a Sons of Issachar anointing on the body of Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless. <laughs>